Hello, my dear students. Welcome. On this session, we are going to discuss macrolid antibiotics. And what's the purpose? On the previous sessions, we were discussing beta-lactam antibiotics, that's penicillin, cephalosporins, and we were discussing various alternatives to penicillin. And we had divided the alternatives to penicillin into two groups, drugs which inhibit cell wall synthesis and drugs which inhibit protein synthesis. Now let's have a look at the alternatives to penicillin in a different way, in a totally different way. Let's have a look at the chart. Now I'm telling you the drugs used as alternatives to penicillin on the basis of what to use if the organism is resistant to penicillin and what to use if the patient is allergic to penicillin. The organism may be sensitive but you can't use penicillin because the patient has penicillin hypersensitivity. So left hand side of the column is showing the penicillinase resistance. So if the organ, if there is penicillinase, penicillin resistance, what to use? For example, if there is MRSA, we think of using vancomycin, tycoplanin and daptomycin or we think of using streptogramin which is a combination of quinupristin and dalfopristin or next we think of linezolid or we think of keptobiprol and keftarolin and there are also carbapenams. I've included them down just to complete the list of other beta-lactam antibiotics. But basically, vancomycin, streptogramins, linozolid and the newer fifth generation cephalosporins. Coming to the other side, the right side, the drugs which could be used if the patient has penicillin allergy or the beta-lactam allergy. So you have astrionam which is a beta-lactam antibiotic but can be used in patients with penicillin allergy. Second most important option is clindamycin and we have discussed clindamycin on some previous session. The next option is macrolids and the last one is rifampin which is to be rarely practiced. So with all this discussion now we have come up to macrolids so let's discuss the macrolid antibiotics. Macro is large and lid is nucleus because these drugs have got a large lactone ring they are called macrolid antibiotics. The prototype of macrolids is erythromycin which is originally obtained from streptomyces erythrus and is a 14 member lactone ring is the structure of erythromycin. Then there are semi-synthetic macrolids which came later is roxithromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin and dirithromycin. Let's start the discussion with the mechanism of action. There is inhibition of protein synthesis by reversibly binding to the 50S ribosomal subunit. This is the mechanism. They inhibit protein synthesis by binding to 50S ribosomal subunit. Do they have a specific site for binding? Yes. The specific receptor site for binding is 23S rRNA receptor which is present on the 50S subunit. This is going to inhibit the translocation of tRNA from the amino acid site, that's A site, acceptor site, to the peptidyl site. So the translocation of tRNA is going to be affected and there's no action on 60S or 40S in the mammalian cells. So there's no penetration in the mitochondrial membranes of the host. That's very important to remember about macrolids. Erythromycin is mostly bacteristatic but may be cidal at high concentrations and the newer agents are mostly bactericidal. What's the mechanism of resistance practiced by the various microorganisms? Number one, microorganisms have a efflux pump which can lead to decreased permeability or there's inability to take up the macrolids. The second one, production of methylase and there'll be methylation of the binding site on the 50S ribosomal subunit. So it's as good as producing an alteration in the binding sites and this is mostly practiced by gram-positive organisms. Alteration of the specific receptor site which is called 23S tRNA receptor site. This could be altered and then there will be decreased affinity for the 50S ribosomal subunit binding. And lastly, there is plasmid associated esterase formation which is practiced by the coliform bacteria and this leads to hydrolysis of the antibiotic. Let's go to the next slide to discuss the spectrum and uses. Erythromycin is the drug of first choice 
for certain illnesses. And you can remember the mnemonic LMW, what you call low molecular weight. You can remember L, M and W. What's this L, M and W? One is Legionella pneumonia. That's Legionella, Legionella pneumophilia. That's L. Next one is Mycoplasma pneumonia. That's M. And the third one is whooping cough or Bartletella pertussis. So if you remember these three infections, you're going to tell your examiner some very important indications of erythromycin. That's Legionella, Mycoplasma and whooping cough. The next indication is carrier state of diphtheria and also in penicillin allergic patients for Streptococcus pyogenes infection that's pharyngitis, sinusitis and otitis media. Streptococcus pneumonia infections like pneumonia and other respiratory infections and staphylococcal infections except MRSA and you can think of using it for H influenza, otitis media as well as sinusitis and lastly syphilis and gonorrhea. So these are some of the indications for erythromycin. Please don't forget the drug of first choice for Legionella, Mycoplasma, whooping cough as well as the carrier state in diphtheria. Continuing with the uses or indications of erythromycin, it's used as a drug of second choice because there may be a drug of first choice which is the best one. If you can't use it for some reason, then you can think of erythromycin as a drug of second choice for chlamydial infections. That's trachoma and cetacosis and urethritis and inclusion conjunctivitis and pneumonia, all the chlamydial infections. Then chancroid produced by Haemophilus ducri, the rickett cell infections, you can use, think of using erythromycin. The Campylobacter J. Jr. H. pylori peptic ulcer, I hope you know macrolides are useful in H. pylori peptic ulcer and the urea plasma uraliticum. So these are some of the indications, the second choice. Let's revise. Chlamydia, chancroid, rickett cell infection, peptic ulcer and urea plasma. One important organism I'm mentioning separately is mycobacteria. That's the atypical mycobacteria, mycobacterium avium, as well as mycobacterium leprae, which produces leprosy and newer macrolids are useful for these conditions. As far as the macrolid antibiotics are concerned and we are speaking about erythromycin, we need to remember one different way of action of erythromycin. Erythromycin stimulates motilin receptors on the gastrointestinal smooth muscle and it acts as a motilin receptor agonist. What's this motilin? Motilin is secreted by the enterochromaffin cells and it increases the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, leads to prokinetic effect and increases the pepsin. So erythromycin is going to act as motilin receptor agonist. It's going to produce the same effect. So I hope you understand erythromycin is going to stimulate the gastrointestinal motility. We can make use of this particular property for managing diabetic gastroparesis. Of course, tolerance develops to erythromycin and chronic use. But this particular special property of the motilin receptor agonistic capacity could be made use of for, for management of diabetes gastroparesis. Let's come to the preparations and doses of erythromycin. It's available as enteric coated tablet or capsule to avoid the destruction by gastric hydrochloric acid. One of the salts is estolate. Estolate is finely absorbed. The next salt is propionate which produces abdominal pain. Then there is stearate and ethyl succinate and there is lactobionate which is available for intravenous route. Intramuscular injections are painful and the dose of erythromycin is 250 to 500 milligrams every 6 hours. Going on to the next slide, we discuss the adverse effects of macrolids. Macrolids produce cholestatic jaundice and hepatitis. It's a very important adverse effect especially with erythromycin estolate and this is seen more in the women, especially during pregnancy. It's less with other salts and it's less with clarithromycin. Next, erythromycin or macrolides are known for reversible autotoxicity, that's transient hearing loss. When erythromycin is used in high doses, that's 4 grams per day and it's seen with all macrolides. Next, of course, hypersensitivity reactions are rash, fever, leukopenia, especially this is seen with erythromycin estolate. Then due to the motilin receptor agonist property 
erythromycin can stimulate the GI motility and sometimes can produce spasmodic pain or severe epigastric pain as well as diarrhea, nausea and vomiting are known with erythromycin. Least gastrointestinal adverse effects are seen with azithromycin. So we need to remember azithromycin from the newer macrolides for least gastrointestinal adverse effects. Next, the drug interactions. Macrolides are potent inhibitors of the cytochrome P450 enzyme system, especially erythromycin and clarithromycin. I hope you understand the hepatic microsomal enzyme system inhibition. If a drug is used for a long period of time, is going to decrease the metabolism of other drugs and is going to lead to excess effect or toxic effect of other drugs. For example, oral anticoagulants like warfarin, its metabolism will be inhibited and this could lead to bleeding. The drugs like terfenidine, astemazole and cisapride, which I often call TAC and pimozide, these have got the capacity to prolong the QT interval and produce torsed day point arrhythmia and deaths. So if erythromycin or clarithromycin is accompanied in the management with any of these drugs, terfenidine, astemazole, cisapride, there's more chance of getting cardiac arrhythmia. Theophylline is another drug if its metabolism is inhibited is going to lead to vomiting, tremor and tachycardia because theophylline is a cardiac stimulant there will be sympathetic stimulation. Oral antidiabetic drugs which are there which are known to cause hypoglycemia if erythromycin is accompanied is going to inhibit the metabolism of oral antidiabetic drugs oral hypoglycemic drugs and there will be excess effect and there will be hypoglycemia. Erythromycin and clarithromycin are also known to increase the effects of corticosteroids, carbamazepine, cycloserine, valproate, all the drugs which are fairly toxic we need to remember. Erythromycin, clarithromycin have got pretty wide spectrum of activity. So they can suppress the microbial flora and when the microbial flora is suppressed there could be digoxin toxicity. Macrolids used along with statins can lead to myopathies. So that's another drug interaction, a different kind of drug interaction. And if you mix erythromycin, clarithromycin, the macrolids in a syringe with some other drugs, there can be an in vitro drug interaction or a pharmaceutical drug interaction. These substances are vitamin B complex, vitamin C, tetracyclines, chloramphenicol, and aminoglycosides. Let's have a view at the drug interactions. Once again, I'm keeping the slide for you. The most important reason for the interactions is macrolids inhibit the cytochrome P450 enzyme system and they inhibit the metabolism of number of drugs. So those drugs will not be metabolized. Their plasma levels will be high and it will lead to excess effect or toxic effects. Most important to remember, oral anticoagulants will lead to bleeding. Oral antidiabetic drugs will lead to hypoglycemia. Terfenidine, astemazole, cisapride, the drugs known to prolong the QT interval are going to produce cardiac arrhythmia. So these are some important issues as far as microsomal enzyme system inhibition is concerned. Next, we move on to discuss the newer macrolids. Newer macrolids are semi-synthetic derivatives. They are more acid stable and they are less toxic to liver. They have got a long duration of action. So you can use them once a day or twice a day. There are some drugs which even can be used just once a week or twice a week because of a very long half-life. They are sidal and their drug interactions are comparatively less, especially azithromycin has got less drug interactions. The users of the newer macrolids include Mycobacterium avium intracellulari complex and H. pylori peptic ulcer, then H. influenza infections, atypical mycobacterial infections, as well as Mycobacterium lepri. And some of the names of the newer macrolids are azithromycin, clarithromycin, roxithromycin. Having so many advantages, we are obviously going to use the newer macrolids. Once again, to revise, they are more acid stable, they are less toxic to liver, they are sidal in nature, and they have got a long duration of action with some special action on atypical mycobacteria as well as mycobacterium lepri. Let's discuss them. We have on this table roxithromycin, clarithromycin, and azithromycin taken together. 
so that we can compare. I said we prefer them because there is long duration of action. Look at the long duration of action. Raksitromycin, the half-life is about 12 hours. With clarithromycin, the half-life is 3 to 7 hours. And with azithromycin, the it's a long-acting drug. Its elimination half-life is 68 hours. The elimination half-life is 68 hours. The advantage of this is, this drug can be used once a day. That's 500 milligrams every day. You can give it once a day and it can suffice. That's great about azithromycin. Roxithromycin is used as 150 milligrams two times a day and clarithromycin is used as 250 to 500 milligrams two times a day. Look at the next, next item that roxithromycin is acid stable, clarithromycin is also acid stable and leads to formation of active 14 OH metabolite. Azithromycin is more stable and is better absorbed and produces post antibiotic effect. It means even if you look at the plasma concentration, the plasma concentration is less. You can just give the drug once a day and it can maintain a longer tissue concentration because there is wide tissue distribution with azithromycin. Regarding roxithromycin and clarithromycin, the food doesn't interfere with absorption. Whereas with azithromycin, you have to take a precaution. Give the drug one hour before food or two hours after food. Coming to the next item, roxithromycin is mainly excreted in the bile. So if your patient suffers with liver dysfunction, you need to take care. Clarithromycin is mainly excreted in the kidneys. So you need to take care if your patient has renal damage and clarithromycin is not safe in pregnancy. Azithromycin is again excreted in the bile and you need to take care if the patient suffers from liver dysfunction and azithromycin is comparatively safer drug in pregnancy. Lastly, we think about the effect on the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. Roxithromycin, the first one, and azithromycin, they don't have much effect on the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. So roxithro and azithro are going to be safer drugs as far as the drug interactions are concerned, whereas the middle one, clarithromycin, just like erythromycin, it's got a potential of inhibiting the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. Let's try to know when to use the newer macrolids. Roxithromycin is used for moraxella, otitis media, sinusitis and pneumonia and you could use it for legionella pneumonia. Coming to clarithromycin, it's a very useful drug to treat mycobacterium avium complex MAC 500 milligrams two times a day. Clarithromycin is also useful against leprosy. The next important indication is it will be a part of triple therapy for management of peptic ulcer and it will be used in the dose of 500 milligrams two times a day. Along with this, you may be giving omeprazole 20 milligrams two times a day or an amoxicillin or metronidazole, amoxicillin one gram or metronidazole 500 milligrams all the drugs given two times a day. So once again to revise in the triple therapy for peptic ulcer, you can use clarithromycin 500 milligrams two times a day along with two more drugs. One drug could be omeprazole 20 milligrams two times a day and the second drug could be amoxicillin one gram two times a day or metronidazole 500 milligrams two times a day. The next important indication for clarithromycin is toxoplasma encephalitis, toxoplasma encephalitis and the last one is H. influenzae bronchitis. So once again to revise clarithromycin for mycobacterium avium complex and leprosy, the next one is peptic ulcer and the last two are toxoplasma encephalitis and H. influenzae bronchitis. Coming to the last drug, it's a very important addition to the macrolids, azithromycin the longest acting drug having the elimination half-life of 68 hours. Azithromycin is used for chlamydial urethritis and cervicitis just in a single dose. That's one gram single dose. Second important use of azithromycin is 500 milligrams every day for MAC along with ethambutol. So mycobacterium avium complex, 
500 milligrams every day with ethambutol. And the third very common indication for azithromycin is community acquired pneumonia, CAP. Community acquired pneumonia could be caused by various organisms. To mention a few, Mycoplasma, Legionella, H. influenzae, and Pneumococci. They are the important organisms and azithromycin can be used for all these organisms. 500 milligrams every day to begin with and then just 250 milligrams every day for 4 days. So that's the way to use the newer macrolids. We go to the next slide to discuss ketolide which is telithromycin. A ketolide antibiotic related to macrolid is telithromycin. There is substitution of 3 keto group in this particular drug so it's called ketolide and it can be used for macrolid resistant gram positive infections which will include respiratory infections including community acquired pneumonia as we just said or acute exacerbations in chronic bronchitis, sinusitis and streptococcal pharyngitis. The disadvantage of telithromycin is it also inhibits the hepatic myxomal enzyme system or the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. It also prolongs the QT interval so there are chances of cardiac arrhythmia and produces skeletal muscle relaxation so it should not be used in patients with myasthenic gravis but you have an option of using telithromycin for macrolid resistant gram positive infections let's have few important points about the community acquired pneumonia because we spoke about community acquired pneumonia on this module there are two columns in this table and these columns are telling you how to identify the organism in general if there is productive cough if there is purulent sputum and there are RALS and the chest pain and fever and there are no extra pulmonary manifest or infiltrate on x-ray chest it's a pneumococcal infection and in 85% of the cases it is a pneumococcal infection in community acquired pneumonia on the other side if the cough is non-productive there is no chest pain and there are extra pulmonary manifest like diarrhea, mental confusion and rash. These are the 15% cases. Most likely is likely to be mycoplasma, chlamydia and legionella. I hope this slide will be useful to you to differentiate between the microorganism. MSC, the profile axis of MSC is extremely important which is to be monitored with CD4 count and you can give clarithromycin or azithromycin Acetromycin has got a long half-life and acetromycin can be just used once weekly for prophylaxis of MAC. For treatment, azithro or clarithro can be used with ethambutol and or rifabutin. Now we have an overview of some sexually transmitted diseases. Because as I, as I see, we are discussing various antimicrobial agents in the chemotherapy sessions. And as I remember, I discussed cephalosporins, I discussed penicillins, and we are in macrolids. It's right time to say this. Some sexually transmitted diseases. Keftrioxone is the drug of choice for resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Doxycycline is a choice for chlamydial infections. And azithromycin, the macrolid, is the choice for both. If it's Neisseria gonorrhea or if it's chlamydia, you can use azithromycin for both. For non gonococcal urethritis, that's mycoplasma, ureplasma, or chlamydia, again, you can think of macrolids. That's very special about macrolids. And if it's trichomonas or if, if it's Gardnerella, then you can think of metronidazole. So that's important about sexually transmitted diseases. You can have a look at it. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, keftriaxone, chlamydia, doxycycline. But both the illnesses, azithromycin. Non gonococcal urethritis, macrolids. Trichomonas and Gardnerella is metronidazole. The last alternative to penicillin is rifampin or rifampicin and as you know it's an anti-tuberculosis and anti-leprosy drug. It's got many other uses and that will be the last alternative for gram positive septicemia. We are going to discuss about rifampin in details on the module when we are going to discuss tuberculosis. I hope you enjoyed this module on macrolids and it's going to be useful to you. Best of luck. Thank you.